Hey there, welcome to the Jeff and Heidi Show, where you're going to have the opportunity to listen to and learn from everyday entrepreneurs. All right, welcome to the Jeff and Heidi Show. We're excited to be here today. I'm with my co-host, Heidi Anderson of ECI BFS, and we're excited to have Kevin Hancock with us today. Um, Kevin, he's got a, an incredible uh, resume, but he's an award-winning author, he's a speaker, he's a CEO, and he's got some really great thoughts on leadership. Um, and I'll, I just want to share a little bit about, uh, his background and his company, but Hank, it was established in 1848, Hancock Lumber was established and it operates 10 retail stores, three sawmills, a trust plant. The company also grows trees on 12,000 12, acres of timberland in Southern Maine and is led by its 550 employees. Hancock Lumber is a six time recipient of the best place to work in Maine award and, I, I really could go on and on, um, <laughs> but incredible story of this company. And I don't want to get into it because I know that Kevin's going to tell a lot better story for it and give it a lot more credibility. But Kevin, I really appreciate you being with, with us. Um, I've had an opportunity to read about you, watch your TED talk and stuff like that. And you've just got an intriguing story. So thanks for being with us and go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself. Sure. Jeff and Heidi, thank you for having me. It's great to be with you, you both. So, yeah, you kind of covered the first part. I'm lucky to be connected to one of the oldest family businesses in America. So our company dates back to before the Civil War, and I'm part of the sixth generation of my family to be able to help lead and work for the company. The story starts to get interesting in 2010 at the peak of the housing and mortgage market collapse. I uh, began to have trouble talking, something I'd always done a lot of <laughs> and taken for granted. Uh, when I went to talk, all the muscles in my throat would kind of spasm and squeeze and contract. And, and my voice got very broken and choppy and uh, talking suddenly became hard. Uh, and it turned out I'd acquired a very rare neurological voice disorder called spasmodic dysphonia. But from a leadership standpoint, I had to suddenly think very differently about being a CEO. My tool really had been my voice, and suddenly I couldn't uh, use it. And instinctively, when, you're, when it's hard to talk, you develop strategies for doing less of it. And my primary strategy was to answer a question with a question, thereby putting the conversation right back on the other person. So someone would come up to me at work with a question or a problem because I was the CEO or one of the bosses of the company, and I started simply responding by saying, well, that is a good question. What do you think we should do about it? And at first, it had nothing to do with leadership. I was just protecting my broken voice. But after having played this out hundreds of times, uh, it got really interesting because here's what, what caught my attention in a nutshell. People already knew what to do. They already had great answers and solutions. They didn't really need top-down direction as much as they needed support and encouragement and safety to trust their own voice, if you will. And that is what really got me into this idea of uh, dispersing power instead of collecting it. And that maybe a bit of my own voice um, deficiency was a bit of a gift or a calling or an invitation to give a stronger voice to others. And I got really caught up in this idea of, well, what if everybody led? What if everybody led? Wouldn't that be a more powerful uh, social and business model? Just to finish 
well, let me jump forward to 2012, the other half of this. A couple years after my voice condition, I started uh, serendipitously initially traveling from my home in Maine to the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in the southwest corner of South Dakota, a place I've now been over 20 times. Pine Ridge is the biggest uh, poorest, most remote, traditionally disenfranchised of all the Sioux reservations on the northern plains. And here was the connection. So there, I encountered an entire community that didn't feel fully heard, that felt like a piece of their voice had been taken or... Uh, stolen. So out of those two events, my own voice condition led me to think differently about leadership. And then my time at Pine Ridge, I had a kind of a, a five kind of core learnings came to me from that. First, I actually understood what it was like to not feel fully heard because I couldn't always express myself. And at Pine Ridge, it really struck me that, you know, there are lots of ways for humans to lose a piece of their voice in this world. And then I got really thinking about some, some inanswerable questions, like the very meaning of a human life on Earth. And I said to myself, well, maybe uh, it's to self-actualize. Maybe the common shared journey that we're all on is that we're just here trying to find our own true voice to know it, to live it, to love it, and to kind of gift it to the collective consciousness of humanity. But then when I got thinking back on, on leadership, it hit me that, that historically, probably across time, leaders had done more to limit, restrict, and direct the voices of others than to free them. And then that's when it hit me that maybe my voice condition was an invitation to try something different, which again was to disperse power, not collect it, to share leadership broadly, and to see if a company could be a platform for strengthening the voices of others in a way that would, yes, improve the performance of the company, but that that really, for me, became the outcome of a higher calling. That higher calling was a platform for adults to self-actualize and thinking really differently about the very mission of work in the 21st century. Uh, there's so that's so, the story. So much I love about this conversation. But um, one quick question. What led you to start traveling to that Indian reservation? You just said you kind of started traveling there. But what was it for business or? Yeah, it was really, uh, really quite random at the time, Heidi. I, by 2012, um, the, the housing market had stabilized. I kind of figured out how to deal with my voice. And I had this growing feeling, though, that I needed some time to uh, kind of recover or serve myself, if you will. And I always had a love affair with the American West my whole life. And anyway, uh, in August of 2012, I randomly picked up a copy of National Geographic. And the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation was the cover story. And I read that article, and it was as if, like, every character – in that story came out of that magazine. I've never had this feeling before or since. It gave me this giant hug and I read it and with no more planning than this, said to my wife, I said, I'm gonna go there. I wanna see what life is like for the people who live there. And so the first trip was super innocent, turned into a second trip, you know, and I've now, as I said, been there, I think almost two dozen times. Love it. So. Yeah. 2010 is when you got diagnosed. Um, how long had you been the CEO before that? So my uh, dad, who ran the company before me, passed away in 1997. Uh, he died young at the age of 54. And I pretty much took over the company at the age of 
31 and like 31 year olds think i was sure that was this was not the no problem i can do this <laughs> <laughs> and i had no idea how much i didn't know and how much i had to learn about um leading and how difficult and challenging it would it would be did you work so, for the corporation before that or did you just <laughs> jump yeah, in, so, into the fire <laughs> right so that's a great question Heidi so growing up like summer jobs yes uh, you know a lot but uh, I went to college um, and I wanted to I was going to be a teacher and a coach and I never actually thought about coming to work for the family business which I laugh about in hindsight because probably others thought it was ordained that that would be my path but it, it never actually really occurred to me until my dad got sick and then I kind of did an about face and uh, and now 30 years later here I am so you had quite a few years of leadership in that company before you made this transition so tell us about how that transition was received in the company and how you know what kind of results and you know how were your employees and your leadership within the company when that happened yeah my leadership approach before my voice condition would have looked very traditional to you i was the earliest to arrive the last to leave i was at every meeting presiding you know i was the voice of the company that's how i had thought you did it and it's often how it is done right and that suddenly it wasn't possible so then we got into this mode of dispersed power and while we kind of backed into it because of my voice condition once we saw what was happening we kept doubling down and doubling down so we for example today to some of the results we do an annual third party engagement survey and as you probably know engagement at work nationally runs about 33 percent it's one of the saddest statistics uh in in business so two out of three people don't find their work meaningful two out of three at Hancock lumber where we typically now run about 90 percent so about nine out of ten really? people will confidentially describe their work experience as meaningful and rewarding to them and because we focused on that uh the company ended up thriving and i share this only this next data point only as testimony to the power of focusing on employees as humans and their experience in the 10 years that followed we made more well we made more money from 2010 to 2020 than the company did from 1848 to 2010 that's the simplest way i can put it in perspective and i hope you understand the spirit of that and the spirit of that is that the profit for us has become the outcome of a higher purpose which is bringing meaning and voice into the world of work and really focusing on creating what i've come to talk about as an employee centric company where the first priority of the company is the experience of the people who work there, which actually forces you to take on a lot of long established assumptions about business. So I stood up a couple years back in front of a group of our biggest customers said you know that old saying the customer comes first i don't actually believe that's true anymore i was sweating when i said this i was so nervous but i went on to explain myself and i said here's what i do believe i believe that the people who are going to take care of the customer should come first and if a company creates a world-class experience for the employees, those employees will, I guarantee you, in return, create a world-class experience for the customer. What was the initial response when you had that conversation? 
Well, I think um, initially some people laughed. They're like, oh, we must be kidding. But <laughs> but then, well, then I, I did throw some humor in to use a piece of main slang. What I like to say now is the customer comes a wicked close second. <laughs> so so the word That's wicked, strange. do you know the word wicked in Maine? It means good when you yeah. say it. So we're really into our customers. They're super important to us, but they don't technically come first. The people that work here are going to come first. And on a serious note, our customers, I think today, years later, take that as a real source of pride. They know that the company they're buying from is super focused on the employees they're working with. And I think that they Uh, are really support that and believe in that. And it's part of the, what's become the stickiness of our company. Well, it's also just that creating that energy and that culture in your company is it like putting a, a little bit of joy into your, your product and that, cause everything's energy, right? So you're, you're like injecting everything. And the fact that you give your employees ownership of their position, that's like, We've talked about this before where if, if you can treat them like they're all little entrepreneurs, or not little, maybe, maybe they're big, but they're all their own little entrepreneur for their job and, and they own that job and they take it more seriously and they care about it. And as a result, they just naturally will take better care of your customers. And so everybody wins. Yes, I love how you said that, and I totally believe in that. It's the um, – it's a – populist approach to entrepreneurship <laughs> that if you're human if you're human you're an entrepreneur or you're invited to be an entrepreneur right. and thinking about entrepreneurship is not just something that that a, a founder or an executive does to me is a much more dynamic approach to entrepreneurship so i totally agree with that heidi Absolutely. And we've had a lot of people on the show who left the corporate world to, to start their own thing. And a lot of it was, and I was one of them. It's just so just, just disillusionment with working for a corporation. And like I said, not feeling her, not, you know, and just going like, what am I doing here? And, and then you get, get out and, and you can do your own thing and you have some autonomy and some freedom. And, and the, the, if more corporations would create that as you have within their corporation, then people, they might keep their employees a lot longer. <laughs> right. I, no, and I'll tell you what struck me in hindsight had struck me. It's how easy it was to flip this because this is really, I mean, who wouldn't want to operate in an empowered environment that celebrates and honors you, everyone? Uh, that's really where humans want to be. So once you change the mission, which was our first step, we changed the mission of the company. The first mission is to make sure that the people that work here are having a meaningful experience and that we're adding value to their lives. And then with that new mission, we needed a new metric. So how were we going to measure that? And so that we, um, focused on the best places to work survey, which is a national program that any company can participate in that produces a, a total company engagement score. And we said to our senior ma managers, this is your new most important metric. You go drive this metric and all the other metrics we believe will, will follow on that flywheel. And that's, in our case, exactly what's happened. So the, it's it's an incredible story. I mean, you look at from that perspective and how well you've done with the best places to work survey. Obviously, that's been huge results. And then the results of the company, how it's done financially has been excellent, of course. So let's take into consideration what you've learned from this how it's expanded to what you have done with the Pine Ridge Reservation, other things, and how you've put this out in the world and done it beyond your company. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I love thinking about it that way. I, I think I'll, I would answer that with a, 
with a question that really drives me, and it's this. What if everybody on Earth felt trusted, respected, valued, heard, and safe? What might change? Everything. And I, yes, Heidi, I could see. I could see. Everything. Yes, I believe everything would change. Yeah. Everything would change. And so then how are you going to drive that? Well, you've got to drive it at the local level where people are having their life experience. This, you know, that's where it has to happen. And it, so suddenly the place of work becomes a potential hotspot for social change. You know, uh, well, in America, I think it's 160 million people work. So work becomes the forum where adults are spending a large part of their life and where you could try to um, – get at that very question of helping them feel trusted, respected, valued, heard, and safe. And then like ripples, that just keeps paying um, it, itself forward. So it really, to me, um, just changes the, the very meaning, which I like to think about. I mean, what's the purpose of work in the 21st century? What, what should its purpose be? And if it's purely economic, that's got pretty short legs. I think we all can sense that. That's important. But to me, as I said, that's really the outcome of a higher calling, which is being meaningful right. for people that are working. Now, how did you bring this to the Indian reservation? Do you, um, do you train their leadership? I mean, or you know, get, get them on board. And how has it affected that Indian reservation? So th that uh, is another great question. So the title of my book, I'm just going to grab this to help make the point. It's called the Seventh Power, and and the uh, in Sioux culture, the medicine wheel is their sacred symbol. And that medicine wheel honors uh, the six great external powers, west, north, east, south, sky, and earth. But I had someone show me one day that at the very center of the wheel, a uh, seventh power exists. And that seventh power is you. It's me. It's the individual human spirit. When, before the reservation era, when the Plains tribes were self-sufficient and prosperous, um, their culture put a really big emphasis on honoring the individual human spirit. The reservation era then became the ultimate unfortunate exercise in power from away, top-down leadership from uh, a foreign capital that just conquered uh, and it just conquered you, you know, back in the second half of the 19th century. And under that approach, these communities became the poorest places in America. But it wasn't the people there, the people there are great as people are globally. It was that leadership structure that really, really took away the power of the individual human spirit. So for me, this is really all about, um, again, dispersing power and honoring the individual. Now, at Pine Ridge, what do I do about it? I used to have trouble answering that question, Heidi, because I don't really do anything about it there. All I do when I'm there is I go around and hang out with the people I know there. That is all I do. But I've started to realize or believe that um, awareness and connectivity in and of itself is a really powerful act. Like I see you. I know you're here. I know what happened. I think you're important. That in and of itself is 
power generating for people. Wow. So I think I know this answer, but I want to hear it from you. Um, in your book, is, is it a business management book? Uh, yes, but but in part because the publishing industry made it be that, <laughs> and, I, and I'm glad it is. There's a, there's a definite business leadership thread to the book, but for me, it's a human book. The, the, that, that's the, what the I lessons, was expecting that it was. Yes, the lessons in the book for me are meant for humans. And the publishing world doesn't really have a category for books for humans, so they, they kind of put you <laughs> in one. So I, what I tried to do is end up writing a book that would be really valuable to business leaders, to all kinds of leaders, but also, for me, more importantly, uh, for rethinking the very premises of followership. It's really an invitation for humans to take back their own power. It could really almost fall under it like a spiritual book, like a, or a, a, you know, or self-development is one way of saying it, but to me, like a spiritual business. And I, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I feel like that's something that really is missing are, you know, like spiritual business books, not religious, spiritual, like, and like you said, honoring the human, honoring the, um, the higher power, whatever that is to anybody. Um, and, I, 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 I'm going to get your book for sure. <laughs> yes, that, I would. they need to create that category, Heidi, because that's where my book belongs. And if I might, one quick story, little story from the beginning of the book that supports what you just said. So um, I was walking in the Arizona desert, actually, on the Navajo Reservation at sunset one evening when um, these five words – came to me that pulled everything together for me. Absolute true story. Those five words were, in nature, power is dispersed. In nature, power is dispersed. So I stopped and I looked around and I started posing a series of questions to the desert. I was the only one there. I said out loud, I said, uh, where's the capital of this desert? Where is its headquarters? Where is the CEO? Where are the managers? Where are the supervisors? I pointed to the couple of the cactus, and I said, which one of you is in charge of all the other cactuses? <laughs> and it's comical to think about it that way, right? If someone said, where is the sacred, secret leadership sauce in nature? It lives in every piece of nature. And humans who are a part of nature, not above it, are ultimately aspiring to organize in this same way. But for that to happen, our leadership model and philosophy and structure has got to totally invert itself. It's got to flip itself inside out. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was having this conversation actually with my son over the weekend, and he lives up um, in uh, right off the edge of, of the Indian um, uh, territory up in the um, north northeast part of Arizona, and um, and he mountain bikes up there and everything, and 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 we were having a conversation about the disparity between the Indian reservation and like you drive through there and and how people live, and I'm like, how how did this happen? And you've really given that, you've really answered a lot of that for me. But I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I, I, I still doesn't make sense to me that that ever did happen. But, 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 you know, like, what is it going to take to, to make that shift? And I know, like, all the craziness that's going on right now is part of it. You know, and we, it, like, we're in the middle of this kind of chaos that and, and people, some people think it's bad, but I, I think it's, it's just, it's kind of like shaking that etch a sketch. <laughs> right. No, my, my book um, looks at seven kind of lessons for the age of shared leadership and to what you were talking about, Heidi. One of them uh, is that overreaching has consequences. So one of the subjects I explore in this book is that more often than not, those who've had the most power 
have overreached. They've gone too far. They've overplayed their hand. And that is not sustainable. You might get away with it for what seems like an eternity, but it ultimately collapses back upon everybody. And so we need to transition from overreaching as leaders to restraint, I talk about in the book. And I define restraint as having the most power, but not using it. So being the CEO who could set every agenda for discussion, who could preside over every meeting, who could finalize every decision, but not doing that, that's the new leadership skill. It's having the power, but not being really tactical about when and how you use it. Now, can we get a write in vote for you for president? Because <laughs> <laughs> that would be so awesome. <laughs> Well, I know, and I've thought a lot about this, too. I think this is in part why government struggles right now. It's not that there are bad people in government. They're all, they're all great humans, too. But the whole system of trying to run something from Washington that doesn't work anymore. You can't, you can't do that. And so it's the structure doesn't work. Right. And it, 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 so, it worked when the country was the, formed and there was only like 13 colonies yeah. that they were, you know, but now it's, it's, yeah. It, this, yeah. Right. Okay. So this is, this is one of the big things I try to uh, uh, open up in the book is it's for centuries collecting power worked. It right. worked, but where we're headed, it doesn't work. And so we've got that, that, that has crested, but we don't yet have a critical mass of leaders who have recognized that, but it has crested. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's actually funny. Um, on, on my other podcast this morning, I talked about leadership and this just ties in so much with it. And, you know, I, I hope all our listeners will go out and get it. The Seventh Power. It sounds like an amazing book. And the thing you need to remember is, you know, as a leader and understanding this and applying this, it's not just a leader of a business or a leader in government. You know, we've got leaders within everything we do. You're, you know, we've got leaders in our you're family. Flipping out a little bit, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we've got, I was just saying, we've got, you know, leadership position with, your family, your everything you're involved in, there's leadership positions. And how do you go about that leadership? And how do you take that? So I hope all our listeners will go out and get the seventh power because I think it's going to help everyone that reads it. So, you know, we're getting, we're getting to our time limit here. So Kevin, I'd appreciate it if you just make sure our listeners know where they can get this book and also where they can stay in contact with you as well. Sure. So uh, the my the book the full title is the seventh power, one CEO's journey into the business of shared leadership, and it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and wherever books are sold. But you can also go directly to my website, which is Kevin. D Hancock.com, Kevin D Hancock.com, and you can access the book there as well as a bunch of other resources, and you can communicate with me there. And I'd love to hear from people who've heard the show or seen the book, and I really appreciate the opportunity you've given me today to uh, strengthen my voice. That's really what you do when you think about it. You help strengthen the voices of others with the work you do. So I'm super happy to uh, have had this opportunity to be with you. Oh, so grateful that you that you allowed us to do this because I mean, this is a conversation that I – that, that needs to be had and, and uh, more people need to hear it. So really appreciate you giving us your voice today. 
Absolutely. Thank you. Th- thank you so much. It was great. And I love the story and we, we really could, we could sit here for hours and listen <laughs> to this and go deeper, but thank you for sharing that. And I can't wait to read the book. So thank you. you Thanks for being with us. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, then. Bye. <laughs> Hey, thanks for being with us. I hope you enjoyed that episode and you got a lot of value out of it. Please subscribe and make sure you don't miss any future episodes. And please come visit our websites, jeffhagey.com and ecibfs.com. Thanks again for being with us and hope to see you next time.